Australia's former prime minister warns Britain about Chinese tech companies. Symantec says Whitefly was behind Singh Health's massive data breach. Iranian hackers show code overlap. Intel's CPUs are vulnerable to another speculative execution flaw. The NSA hasn't been using its domestic phone surveillance program lately. Sharing code presents dangers. And Google will ban political ads in Canada. Now I'd like to share some words about our sponsor, Akamai. You're familiar with cloud security, but what about security at the edge? With the world's only intelligent edge platform, Akamai stops attacks at the edge before they reach your apps, infrastructure, and people. Their visibility into 178 billion attacks per day means that Akamai stays ahead of the latest threats, including responding to zero-day vulnerabilities. With 24-7, 365 Security Operations Center support around the globe and over 300 security experts in-house, Akamai surrounds and protects your users wherever they are, at the core, in the cloud, or at the edge. If you're going to RSA this year, visit Akamai in the North Hall, booth 6153, to take part in their Crack the Code Challenge for an opportunity to win a new 3D printer. Akamai, intelligent security starts at the edge. Learn more at Akamai, that's A-K-A-M-A-I, dot com slash security. And we thank Akamai for sponsoring our show. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, March 6, 2019. The U.S. isn't alone in its concerns over a prospective Chinese role in 5G networks. Former Prime Minister of Australia Malcolm Turnbull strongly warned Britain against using equipment produced by Huawei or ZTE in its upcoming 5G network, the Sydney Morning Herald reports. In a speech given to the Henry Jackson Society in London last night, Turnbull said Australia's decision to ban Huawei was based on advice from the country's own intelligence agencies and not because of external pressure from the U.S., He pointed to the fact that there are only four major 5G vendors in the world, two of which are Chinese. He added that it beggars belief that none of the Five Eyes countries has a leading 5G vendor. Turnbull said that when assessing the potential danger posed by these companies, quote, it's important to remember that the threat is a combination of capability and intent. Capability can take years or decades to develop, but intent can change in a heartbeat, end quote. Symantec published a report today on the group behind last year's Sing Health data breach. The group, which they've dubbed Whitefly, primarily targets organizations based in Singapore, although links to attacks in other nations suggest that it may be part of a larger intelligence gathering operation. The researchers describe Whitefly as a highly adept group with a large arsenal of tools at its disposal capable of penetrating targeted organizations and maintaining a long-term presence on their networks. The group's primary goal is stealing large amounts of sensitive information, and it uses a wide variety of custom-built and open-source malware tools to do so. Its targets include organizations in the healthcare, media, telecommunications, and engineering industries. A Symantec spokesperson told Reuters that they believe it's a state-sponsored espionage group, but they're not certain which state it's working for. The cyber attack against Singh Health occurred in June 2018 and resulted in the theft of personal data belonging to 1.5 million patients. Singaporean officials stated at the time that they believed a state-sponsored actor was responsible, although they didn't share further details. Palo Alto Network's Unit 42 has identified potential code-sharing between two threat groups linked to Iran. Unit 42 found that the Chafer threat group targeted Turkish government entities late last year using a Python-based payload they've named MechaFlounder. The initial download URL of this payload contains a parameter that's been spotted in many campaigns carried out by Chafer and the oil rig threat group. The researchers also note that malware code used by both groups shares a number of common variable names and the tools exhibit similar functionality. Based on these links, however, they aren't confident enough to combine the two groups. Researchers at LogMeIn, makers of the LastPass password management tool, have used anonymized data gathered from their users 
to get a better picture of where things stand when it comes to how folks are creating, reusing, and managing their passwords. Gerald Bouchel is Chief Information Security Officer at LogMeIn. Overall, like if you really look at the big picture, a moderately good environment where people that are using LastPass are starting uh, to uh, have overall a, a security score that ranges, uh, depending on where you are and what you do, in the 50s. Um, so uh, the average score across all our uh, reports that we looked at was 52 out of 100, which is an internal score that uh, takes into uh, consideration length of password uniqueness across different sites, which means that people are uh, already taking password security quite seriously, but there's also still some, some room for improvement. We're also seeing some regional differences. So the, the scores in, uh, in the U.S. and Europe and uh, other parts of the world are, are higher or lower, sometimes even across industries. There's not a huge variability, though. So it's, like, uh, it's not that um, uh, the U.S. is like uh, in the 90s and uh, the rest of the world is in the 30s or so. Um, there, there is a certain level of general uh, awareness about the password security. But at the same time, there is also, generally speaking, a lot of room for improvement that we're mm-hmm. seeing before. Yeah, one of the things that caught my eye was that uh, you've been tracking a real increase in the use of multi-factor authentication. Absolutely, yeah. That, that's definitely something that uh, uh, we were very pleased to see. Uh, we have uh, uh, about uh, 45% of uh, business users uh, using MFA for uh, for access to their LastPass accounts. And I think that is, uh, given the uh, amount of uh, password breaches and the concerns that we've seen in the past, a really good sign in terms of like uh, people making sure that they are st- starting to take uh, password security seriously, um, especially at the enterprise level. And it's it really amounts to a total increase of about uh, 24.5% from uh, 2017 when we're mm. comparing this. So what were some of the areas where uh, folks could still use some improvement? What are some of the places where people are still coming up short? I think it it really depends a little bit on uh, what sector you're in. So um, for MFA, for example, since we're we're just talking about that, the tech sector is uh, uh, currently at uh, 31% across the board, which is leading the pack to some extent. Um, I think improving uh, multi-factor is something that's important. Um, making sure that there is uh, stronger passwords um, that are automatically generated instead of uh, just levering, leveraging passwords that have been reused from from, uh, from prior accounts and just using LastPass to store them. And then really uh, emphasizing the uh, unicity of the passwords across different accounts. Uh, if we look at the recent recommendations, not so recent anymore, but they have the recommendations from uh, from NIST and from other uh, experts in this field, the, the, the basic idea is really that uh, we want to make sure that um, passwords are very long and uh, are uh, unique across different sites and are not being reused, especially uh, if they have been breached in the past. So um, focusing on that, I think, is going to drive the uh, security score up. And at the same time, uh, make sure that the overall password hygiene and posture is going to be uh, better. Yeah, it was interesting to me. Uh, one of the the uh, statistics here from the report was that fifty percent of users didn't create different passwords for work and for personal accounts. Yeah, that is that is really concerning because if you think about a, a system administrator or somebody who has access to uh, sensitive information as part of their work environment, that they're using the same. Uh, password that they are using, say, for uh, LinkedIn or that they have been using for LinkedIn or any of the other sites that have been breached over the last five to 10 years, then um, those uh, those kind of accounts are obviously at risk through credential stuffing and, and, and similar tactics, which we see really on an ongoing basis across the industry. What we see is like with the, with the right uh, education about how to, sh- how to share or not share password or how to not reuse them, how to enable multi-factor authentication, et cetera, we do see uh, significant increases in adoption of LastPass, and ultimately, what really helpful is like really getting away from the standard ceremony of signing in by by punching in your username, punching in your last uh, uh, your, your your password, and go off to uh, the the paradigm that LastPass offers, which is like simply clicking on a, uh, a tile in your vault in order to to uh, log in. It's like once you really transition users. Uh, to that kind of general behavior through the appropriate engagement, through awareness training, through uh, other forms of education. And it, it becomes second nature, both in their private lives as well as in their work lives. And uh, that really leads to significant adoption and then ultimately a much better security posture. That's Gerald Bouchel from Log Me In.
Intel CPUs are vulnerable to a new flaw stemming from speculative execution, the Register reported yesterday. Researchers from the Worcester Polytechnic Institute and the University of Lubbock released a paper on Friday outlining the vulnerability, which they call Spoiler. The flaw reveals critical information about physical page mappings to user space processes. In other words, it can allow a non-privileged user to discover the physical layout of virtual memory by measuring the timing of speculative operations. Spoiler increases the speed and efficiency of existing side-channel attacks to an extraordinary degree, some of which can be run by JavaScript in a web browser. The vulnerability affects all Intel Core processors and will require hardware mitigations, so a patch will likely take years. One of the researchers told the Register that he doesn't expect the issue to be fully mitigated within the next five years, since microcode patches would cause a significant loss of performance. The National Security Agency hasn't been using its domestic phone surveillance program to track links to foreign threats for the past six years, according to Luke Murray, the National Security Advisor to House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Murray said that he's not certain if the program will start back up. He noted that the system had been running into technical issues last year related to working with telecommunications companies. A spokesman for Mr. McCarthy told the New York Times that Murray, quote, was not speaking on behalf of administration policy or what Congress intends to do on the issue, end quote. Finally, Google will ban political advertising in Canada before that country holds its upcoming federal election. Google's Canada head of public policy and government relations told The Globe and Mail that Canada's new election act was too difficult to comply with. The bill is intended to promote transparency and hinder foreign influence in elections, by requiring Internet companies to keep a record of all the political ads published on their platforms. Google told the Canadian Senate in November that its advertising system is a highly automated bidding process that chooses which ads to display in less than a second, so building a registry beforehand would require a fundamental reworking of its system. The company said the only feasible way to follow this regulation was by banning political ads altogether. Other online platforms, such as newspapers, are also struggling to find ways to comply with the law. Now a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Observe-It. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys. Your employees, contractors, and privileged users – In fact, a whopping 60% of online attacks today are carried out by insiders. Can you afford to ignore this real and growing threat? With Observe-It, you don't have to. See, most security tools only analyze computer, network, or system data. But to stop insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe-It combats insider threats by enabling your security team to detect risky activity, investigate in minutes, effectively respond, and stop data loss. Want to see it in action for yourself? Try Observe-It for free. No installation required. Go to observeit.com slash cyberwire. That's observeit.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Observe-It for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Justin Harvey. He's the Global Incident Response Leader at Accenture. Uh, Justin, it's great to have you back. Uh, I want to touch on a couple things today. Uh, you are out at RSA, so I want to get your take on how the conference is going so far. But also, uh, Accenture, you all just recently released your cost of cybercrime report. Why don't we start with that? What uh, what does the report cover? Well, the cost of cybercrime report, Dave, is based upon interviews with more than 2,600 Uh, security and IT professionals at over 355 organizations worldwide. Hmm. And we put together a comprehensive listing of questions and asking for data, which we've then merged into this final report. And the 2019 cost of cybercrime study really focuses on what our organizations are missing uh, through cybercrime. And there are actually quite a few observations and some data points that I'd like to share with you and the listeners. The first is two types of cyber attacks accounted for one third of the total 
uh, $13 million cost to companies on average. So that means that one-third of the cost of cybercrime comes from malware and malicious insiders. And the average incident cost is over $13 million. Now, keep in mind, Dave, last year was $11.7 million on average. And actually, the cost of responding responding to these incidents has gone up. Uh, another data point that I find very interesting here is also the data point not of the cost, the direct cost of a cyber attack, but we've also, we've actually been able to articulate what companies are missing out on. And that missing out on is revenue. So up hmm. to, in, in some cases, over 3% of, of annual revenue can be lost through a cyber attack in perhaps uh, it's brand damage, perhaps it is the, the revenue opportunities are not there because they're not able to collect revenue from customers, or perhaps they have to delay new services to uh, to generate that revenue. And like I said, it was 3% for the organizations, but it's up and over $580 million worldwide when it is combined. And that number is only going to rise as, as cybercrime increases. Hmm. So in terms of uh, recommendations based on what you gathered from the report, what can you share there? Well, the, the recommendations really come back to the, the same talking points that, that our industry has been talking about for quite some time. It's about building a cyber resilient enterprise, one that can bounce back from a cyber attack to get back to business. Uh, a few of the, of the highlights, automation, orchestration, and machine learning uh, technologies can be deployed and uh, integrated over the next uh, few years that's, that will actually help uh, the two key metrics that we always talk about, Dave. One, mm. the mean time to detect. How can we get better and faster at finding the bad guys? And then finally, the mean time to respond. So not only is it can we find the bad guys, but we can actually get them out of the enterprise uh, uh, faster and in a more timely manner. So I want to switch gears with you. You are there on location at uh, RSA Conference. Uh, what is your overall sense of the show this year? As you walk around, uh, what's the overall tone? The theme this year is products, products, products. There hmm. are an immense amount of products and solutions and platforms and technology that is fueling this industry. And I keep saying it every year. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. There is a ton of investment in security technologies and products. And that is showing in the RSA conference here. This is the first year where they've actually had one contiguous uh, show floor. And years previous, it was north and south. Many of your listeners know that they have Moscone Center here in San Francisco has been renovated. And now it's one huge floor. It is a sea of vendors and technology and it, I'm really waiting for this market consolidation to happen. We've seen the economy kind of plateau, I guess you could say, uh, over the last year. There have been some high, really high highs, really low lows. It's evening out. Um, but there's a lot of an, uh, a capital investments uh, being poured into the technology here. And I can't help but think that coming to this conference – that I could walk away being, let's say, a, a new person saying, oh, well, I need all, do I need all these technologies? Should I do a best of breed solution based approach for every little niche problem I have? Do I need to buy a tool? And I think that many of us are saying, where's the people? Where's the process? Where is the emphasis on the individual and in things like security awareness and training and understanding the threat landscape and really understanding? Uh, the mechanics behind what the adversaries are doing and how to respond to those. And yes, Dave, I do see some some training booths. I do see some uh, security awareness booths. But uh, I think the industry needs to take a little bit of a course correction here and getting back to what's most important, and that is the people. All right, Justin Harvey, thanks for taking the time for us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Observit, the leading insider threat management platform. Learn more at observit.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. 
Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Iben, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.